All right, everybody, if you are out there, you don't want to be out there. You want to be in here because we're going to be talking about one of the most anticipated things of Monero. Just recently launched Alpha. Some people say Kavri. Some people say Kovri. Some people who speak Esperanto actually say Kovri. You know, like it kind of should be said. So we've got an animal here. He's the man. He's the plan. He's the everything. If he dies, we're screwed. So let's, let's give it up for him. He's going to be presenting to us Kavri, an introduction. Thank you. Hey, hey, hey. All right, uh, everyone inside, here we go. All right, I hope you like improv. You know, Miles Davis, Coltrane, good old-fashioned improv. Okay, so, Kovri. Uh, what is Kovri? Before I even wanted to get into that, I wanted to tackle the problem uh, that we're trying to solve. Um, any physicists in the room? Any physicists? Oh, all right, cool, at least one. Okay, so is anyone familiar with anonymity? Okay, got a couple of hands there for an enemy. And familiar enough with Monero to know that it's a privacy project. But anyway, okay. Okay. So, um, let's see. I don't want to tell you what cover is until we establish the problem. Um, but I'm also kind of trapped in my head after working on this all these years that I'm trying to also you know, meet you halfway uh, from the very beginning. Well, so we need to understand that basically everything is public. And I mean everything, I mean existence as you know it, okay? So I'll just start off four things I want to talk about. Um, let's see, privacy and anonymity uh, never existed, it cannot exist, and may never exist uh, within the realm of quantum realistic and in the quantum uh, mechanics. Uh, I know that's kind of heavy and whatnot, but it's important because it defines what we're doing. Uh, secondly, I'd like to talk about identity, um, because it all relates, it's all relative. Um, and then third, I'd like to talk about what we are doing, like what we are really trying to do. I'm talking Monero to you're walking down the street to here we are now. And fourthly, I'd like to uh, present a solution to all of that. Uh, and then actually get you know, forward to this, you know, this actual stuff you can use right now you know, before you leave. So I'd like to open with a question. Uh, so, uh, so what, what is this? Anyone, you can just speak out. And, and it's not a finger, it's not a fingerprint necessarily. I mean, what is this? Like right there. Anyone. This isn't like a Plato's Cave kind of retort. It's not like philosophical. It's like, it's like flat out, what is that? This is clearly definable. It's essentially what we're, we're basing our whole existence around, at least when we're engineering things. Okay, so I'll call this, it's a point in space-time. Now, how did you, how do you know that this is a point in space-time? Sentience is not a requisite, you don't need to have consciousness to prove this. How do you know that this point is right here? Because you can see it, okay. But seeing isn't the same as measuring. We know observing is not the same is measuring. So how do you know? I mean, how do you really know that this is a point in space-time? It's really simple. It's because you are in space-time right now. You are varied points in space-time. You can measure this, you know, via whatever sensory inputs and whatnot. And so who the hell cares? Why does this, what does this have to do with anonymity? Well, the point is, I'm trying to prove to you that there is no such thing as privacy and anonymity. It's just, it cannot happen. And I, it, we just proved it right now. Okay, so you're in space time here. Okay, so what do you mean by that? I don't know, what are you, nut job? Okay, so let's try to cover, right? Let's try to you know, cover this point in space time. I mean, can you prove that this point in space time still exists? Yes, you can. Indirectly or directly, you will, given enough time and energy, you can prove that something is here um, you can speculate, you know, that there might be a black hole there, but it's highly doubtful. Um, and essentially, you can, you can measure, eventually, you will measure with absolute certainty that something is in here, and all its qualities, all its wonderful matter, and what have you. So you say, okay, well, let's just put like 20,000 layers of that, you know, hands upon hand upon hand. Well, I mean, with absolute certainty, you know it's in space-time, because without it, nothing would exist there, and, well, won't we'll go down that rabbit hole. But literally, you can measure it. Given enough tools and time, you will be able to measure. Why am I wrapping this around? What is this? Well, that's the whole essence of layered routing, as you see in Tor, as you see in I2P and Covery. It is the concept of just wrapping things up with math 
and, and hoping someone doesn't you know, figure it out, essentially. OK. So I mean, how about simple terms? OK, here's something you can take and talk to your parents or you know, whoever, loved ones. So you want privacy, you go to the bathroom, what do you do? Thank you. Yeah, you close the door, right? Because you want, because you want privacy. But I hate to break it to you. You are now public to everything within that room. See, it's all relative. You close that door. Okay, sure. sure the, the door. You know, everyone outside the door may not be able to know it. you're there right now. But given enough time and energy, they can measure you. Uh, heat dissipation, uh, entropy, uh, thermodynamics. I mean, it is not some mystery. You will be found given enough time and energy. So you close the door. Okay, you got some privacy. Uh, but then you go to use you know, the facilities and you take off some layers of clothing, right? Because that was, you were private still, right? Well, now you're public to the air. Your skin is public to the air and it is, there is no such thing as privacy. I know that's a bold statement and trust me, I've lost a lot of sleep and I've really tried to prove myself wrong here. I want people to just get involved in the discussion, prove this wrong. Physicists, everyone just... Uh, if you can solve any of like the Einstein field equations without space time, I mean, from Minkowski to care, if you can uh, just f f anything, any, if you can prove any of this, please come to me or get involved. So, privacy doesn't exist. Uh, anonymity. So, how do you define anonymity? You know, and I, sh sorry, I should have asked you how do you define privacy, first of all. I kind of jumped the gun and assumed a lot of things. Does anyone have any other definitions of privacy that I didn't cover? No? Okay. Now, anonymity, anonymity. Does anyone have definition? What is being anonymous? I mean, textbook, it's to not have a name. But that's just kind of silly because uh, you just gave us a name. Uh, it's because you can acknowledge, I won't say communicate, uh, I'll say because you can acknowledge this point in space time, you've essentially assigned it an identity. So I'm sorry, you can't not have a name. So long as you are measurable and observable, you have an identity. So the concept of anonymity is just, it's not possible within the mechanics that we are engineering these systems right now to the best of our ability. Okay, um, and why does that matter? Well, that, again, that's the foundation of Alice and Bob. How do you know Bob? How do you know Alice? How, do you, how can you prove Alice and Bob? Uh, so we'll talk about that too. Uh, so does everyone know who Alice and Bob is? Or are? Okay, I mean, no, yes, no. Okay, so you know, Alice wants to talk to Bob. <laughs> so, I, and as we just discussed, so here are these two points. So what are, they want privacy, right? Well, we know privacy is not possible because they will be publicly talking to each other, <coughs> essentially. Uh, but there are events in between these two points. They're called events, and well, what do you do? I mean, you go to communicate, right? Do you, do you see how privacy and anonymity are not possible? You are relying on the very events in between these two points of space-time in order to get your message across. But ironically, these events between these two points are the very thing that destroys your privacy and anonymity. Yeah, it's, it's a real uh, mind twister. So what, what do we do? We, we attempt to emulate the anonymity and privacy. Um, for example, with uh, Tor and Covery I2P, uh, you essentially send your message through various hops using all kinds of encryption I'll talk about. And then eventually gets there. Bob doesn't necessarily know where you are and uh, vice versa. But it, of course, given enough time and energy, um, the, the, all that information is readily available because you exist within these models of mechanics. Um, yeah, so privacy and anonymity. Uh, okay, so identity. Uh, see, did I ask you, what, how do you define identity? Did I ask that already? No? How, how does anyone def define identity? And not, ma necessar not necessarily mathematical identity, where you know, A equals B, um, which is in itself contentious because at the quantum level, you, you, you may as, it might not actually equal. I mean, that's a whole other thing. But, so no thoughts on identity, huh? Being able to uniquely distinguish something from something else. Okay, yeah. Um, but how do you do that? I mean, essentially, the bottom line is it's all relative. Here we are back to the space time where it's literally everything is relative. It's driving me nuts.
because if we can't solve this problem, then we're never going to have privacy. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, identity is is relative, but more importantly, um, language. Uh, uh, did you have a question? A comment? Yeah. How would you define that context, though? But if it is measurable, then the relative perspective is that no matter how one system defines it, it still is, is relative so long as it can be measured. I don't know if that makes sense. But how do you prove that? <laughs> but, uh, but is that truly identity? And I would say yes, because I'd, like I just said, identity is relative. Um, but uh, I think what's more important is to understand how we use identity and that it, identity is also language. And language itself is also relative. Uh, so, for example, when Alice wants to talk to Bob, they want to set up a Diffie-Hellman exchange, right? To generate a key pair. They're essentially creating a language for each other in a way that supposedly only these two points will be able to communicate. Uh, I don't know how huge that is, but I think it's, it's pretty big because it essentially defines uh, all, these, all these excuses for why we're doing this. It comes down to a lot of these simple basics. Um, language, for example. Uh, so I guess, here, I mean, why does this matter, right? Uh, every day we're, we're trying to have these transactions. We're trying to be anonymous, but why? Can anyone tell me why? That's not like a textbook, you've heard this a thousand times, why? Anyone know why? Why, why, why are we trying to do this? So, this is what I believe, this is based on my preliminary you know, studies of this, but I truly believe, and I think this is the direction we're going, we're essentially trying to bridge two points of space-time into a single point of space-time while retaining the qualities of those two separate points of space-time, which I don't know if that's possible right now. Um, of course, I would like to propose something uh, soon, you know, after, in a few minutes, but uh, think about it. Every time you go walk down the street, every time you go to eat, every time you go to hug someone, every time you open your eyes, every time you try to send a transaction, you're trying to connect with one other point and one other point only. Specifically Monero, specifically, you know, you want to have a transaction with someone and only that person. And unfortunately, you rely on everyone else to try to do that. That's the hack right now. That's like the uh, physics hack we're, we're dealing with. But essentially, that's what our ultimate goal is, I believe. Um, yes, Howard? That's fairly sure doesn't cut it. I mean, like, like I've said, it's all measurable. I mean, it's, it's but, but, not truly private. <laughs> But again, that's all relative because when they're face to face to each other, they're still away from each other. There's always going to be those points of space time within the points. I'm not ignoring the infinity. And what I'm proposing is that's the solution to this problem because you're essentially describing the very same problem is 
there's space time, and I, uh, this is huge. There's two points of space time, and face to face, whether that, I mean, it's always this coming together, you know, it's always this gravity. It's really annoying. But we, we, are, we ultimately are seeking to, if I'm correct, the assumption was we're essentially uh, trying to just avoid all of that space time so we can have that true connection while, while retaining our qualities. And I'm not talking this is something we're just going to whip up some code and do. I'm talking this is a long-term endeavor, essentially describing what our purpose is. You know, we're obsessed with bringing these two points together. It's in everything. Every, it's, in your, your, it's this constant, the essence of movement, if you will. Um, so uh, that is what I see as being the problem, the ultimate problem. And that's why I, you know, I believe here is like this uh, beginnings, the very beginnings of what could be uh, the beginning of a new branch of physics, privacy physics. You know, if, if no one's talked about it, I would like to talk about it more. I'd like to initiate that idea. Uh, privacy mechanics, you know, essentially, uh, if possible, to solve the field equations without space time, that would be great. If not, let's, let's see what else we can do. Uh, it, it's very open-ended, but I like to just get that ball rolling. You know, tell your friends, get more people involved in the conversation. Um, okay, so any questions about that? Now the physicist here might have a few comments too. Please if, correct and or anything. Say anything if you'd like. Ex yeah, exactly, exactly. And if you look at any like equation ever proposed, I mean, if you take out space time, then I mean, you, you take out the concept of you even being able to interpret this equation for theoretically, right? Um, yeah, I, I haven't heard anyone really talk about this. I mean, chaos theory aside and, and other things, I mean, I'm not like involved enough to be like, hey, oh yeah, we've talked about this over lunch. So I don't know, we need more people involved in this. I've never really heard about, essentially, okay, sorry, I missed something. With the idea of privacy mechanics, we're essentially trying to do two things. Bridge, or not even bridge, sorry, excuse me. We're trying to bring two points of space time into one point while retaining the other points, if that even makes any sense. Uh, because if you try to do that and you know, they form something else that defeats the purpose. So we're trying to do that. Um, we're also trying to exist while not existing. Folks, that is true privacy. If you can exist while not existing, but somehow, somehow, uh, rem I mean, I, this is blowing my mind, right? I don't have the math with me right now, but I think those are at least the two found founding questions for something of a privacy mechanics. Did you have a question? Yeah. Lossy. Yeah, so it doesn't quite represent physics, right? Your 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 solution. Uh Zuno's paradox that you're talking about. It's it's my proposal? I mean I don't have a solution. Not necessarily. I, I only propose those two questions. I, how they're achieved, I think we just, I don't, I don't know right now. I'd like more people to get involved. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I what? Attract? Did you say attract? Can you give them a mic? Do you have a mic? I can't hear these people. I think okay. my point is that I don't think it's unreasonable to rely okay. upon an approximation, considering our interpretation of physics 
mathematics is a model that is an approximation of physics and is necessarily so. Until proven otherwise. And I mean, that's why we need more quantum physicists, for well, example. I mean, we get small enough where we no, start no, to no, see. No, I mean, it, it was proven otherwise. That, that is what Gödel's work was. Any system more complicated than a certain, you know, more than simple arithmetic has paradoxes, is a loss. Sure, of paradoxes, system. but I mean, is that a limiting factor? Is it a defining factor for a potential new branch of physics? It's a defining factor for a branch of mathematics, which is our model of physics. Okay. So, so it's okay. unreasonable to expect, no. since your work is probably going to rely on mathematics, that it's also not going to be a perfect model of physics. Sure, sure. Okay, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm just saying uh, let's get the discussion going. I mean, health, there about 30 years ago, uh, there were iPads on Star Trek, and now we have them, you know, for example. So you know, let's, let's get it going. Let's talk more. Let's, let's try. Hey, if, you can, if we can solve this without having to divulge into other, you know, areas, sure. That, I'd love that, please. Okay, um, so that, that, and that. Okay, so uh, I'll briefly talk about, okay, so I said why we're doing that, but here's my little flair. I think uh, it's ultimately true love, okay? <laughs> Sounds corny, but I think this attempt to constantly try to connect with people and connect with these various points of space-time is essentially the essence of love. Uh, that's something to ponder, too. I could elaborate that, and if you like, I don't know if this is the crowd who wants to hear that, but um, I would define it that way. Okay, so we have that, 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 and the proposal, great. Okay, wow, half hour. So how does that relate to Covery? So, is, so no one's really familiar with uh, uh, onion routing or garlic routing, anyone? Okay. Um, geez, I'd, I'd like more interaction. I don't have to explain everything that's already explained, but um, we have a garlic here. But we don't have a Matroshka doll, right? There's no doll, Diego? Okay. Okay, so how about, does everyone know what a Matroshka doll is? One? Okay. How about I do a quick little image search so we're all on the same page? Uh, we're supposed to have a little thing I can demonstrate, but, you know, didn't happen. There we go. All right. So here we go. So back in the mid-90s, um, the Navy started uh, researching, uh, essentially created the, on the Onion Router version zero, long story short. Uh, a couple versions later, uh, version two, here we are with the Tor project. Uh, Roger and Nick are heading that up with a whole team of people. And what they essentially said is, well, we want point A to be anonymous to point B. So they, they said, oh, well, it's, it's uh, well, can't use that. So it's like an onion, you know, an onion has layers. Well, more accurately is actually this Matroshka doll, which they probably like thought of and said, oh no, you can't say the R word, that's, that's a big no-no. Um, but essentially, this is the most, I, I believe, the most accurate way to describe that. So let's see. See how they, you know, they have the little one, goes into this one, it goes, so you can actually twist those off and you put one into the other, into the other, into the other. And you essentially, you have your message for that point B, you put it in, you wrap it up, you send it through various hops um, using uh, public key encryption, uh, and they uh, send it on down, send it on down, without being able to uh, read the original message. It gets to point B, and then point B just does it in reverse, sends it on back. So essentially it's encrypted all the way through. Uh, the points aren't able to discern what your sending, um, unless they have enough time and energy, yes, of course they can prove it, as we discussed. Um, now, that's called like circuit, that's circuit routing, that's uh, really straightforward, three hops, and you're there. But with Covery, and I need an assistant here, would the physicist like to come up and assist? Uh, just standing here and you hold your arms out. Okay. Yay! Okay, sorry, um, okay, so I'll hold my hands out here and could you stand over there and do the same, like this, okay. Okay, so, so I'll be Alice and you be Bob or vice versa, whatever you want. And so, uh, Covery has inbound and outbound tunnels. 
So essentially, I'll extend out, and this will represent my out, and then you extend in. Actually, no, you extend out this way. There we go, perfect. And then her inbound, these are her inbound tunnels, her arms extended in, arms extended out, outbound, my arms extended in. And Cover uses unidirectional tunnels. So we don't, I mean, we complete a circuit, but technically they're unidirectional tunnels where I send one message throughout various hops, all encrypted, goes to her inbound tunnel, also several hops, encrypted. Then she responds through this, uh, your outbound tunnels, beep, <laughs> and comes through my inbound tunnels. Um, that's, that's in summary, unidirectional uni tunnels. So, okay. thank you. Very straightforward stuff. Um, another crypto used uh, for both, oh, that's for tunnels, uh, Elgamal and uh, AES. 256, uh, CBC, um, and session tags, and technical things for that. So, okay, we had this, those tunnels. I guess I shouldn't have sent you back, but essentially, so let's say you want to send the message, right? Well, within that message, you send it through the various hops, and what's great about Covery and I2P is that it's a message-based, fault-tolerant, decentralized system. So you can send in fragments if needed, and they are reassembled at various points, all encrypted, can be decrypted and sent off to the remaining hops. Um, uh, so it's, it's a very, it's that, it's fault tolerant. But essentially, uh, those are called garlic cloves, as we see here. Um, various uh, message, I2NP message types go into a clove, and you know, come there. So I mean, it's, it's essentially, we're essentially layering upon layering upon layering, and we're, and we're asking, and here's the, fault, here's the problem. I mean, this is what breaks every overlay network. Well, at least Tor and I2P and Cobra is you're asking pretty please, pretty, 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 pretty please, this first hop, please don't tell the second hop my IP address. Don't give them any metadata, pretty please. So as you can imagine, the whole model is broken because of trust, because you can't really trust anything. So. Hate to break it to you, as much as you know, everyone loves Tor, these, these things are just unresolved still. And that's what really got me going on this whole space-time um, you know, circus. So, um, any questions on the Matroshka? Any questions? Okay. So we got that, that, and that. And I have a question for you. What do you want to know if, exactly? Do you have any like, specific questions about Covery or about anonymity? No questions? Yes. Oh, uh, Michael. How about Michael? Yes. Did you have a question? I'm most interested to know how a, an application developer would, that, that's making an application independent of any transport, would uh, implement Tor, Covery, maybe different types of, uh, of protection, how they would use that. How they would use it? Right. Uh, sure. Well, once we get the API done by the end of this year, um, hopefully earlier, uh, you would just hook into that as a C++ library, and uh, we'll try to keep it real simple. You know, BSD style sockets, for example. You know, read, write, all that, and you would just say, "I want to send to this address," and it, the Covery address, the base 13 encoded, um, and that's another thing. Okay, destinations. That whole concept of destinations. All right. Uh, so you, it's one tangent after another I can go on. Okay, so you would essentially just hook into the library, but you would need to know the address you want to send to, correct? Um, do you know what address you would want to send to off the top of your head? Network, a, a kind of an agnostic application. You know how you can use Tor proxy to use Tor with anything, with Firefox, or um, and Firefox does not know it's using the Tor network. If you use Tor proxy, is that something that you're uh, thinking of? Well, as well? essentially, Tor, all Tor is doing is it has a, it's a Sox proxy. So we have a Sox proxy uh, if you want to use it, um, but because. Covery and I2P, it's a network within the internet. I mean, you're not going to be able to connect to Google or Facebook unless they are hosting a I2P address destination. You could use a SOX proxy if you wanted something rough and generic, 
Um, if you want more fine tuning, then uh, you would use the API, which uh, it's not out yet. But um, yeah, and that's another thing with destinations. Um, well, before I go into that, more, were there more hands? Okay. Is, is there anything specific to Monero or blockchains that Cover is solving, or is this totally generic specific. solution, specific like to like another an, like another Tor or another I2P, like, or is there something blockchain-y about it? Oh, there's no, there's not there's nothing blockchain, um, not no, nothing blockchain-y about it. Um, but what's important to know is that uh, this this concept, well, there's Tor, you know, there's Tor. Well, you know, it's like saying, well, there's Bitcoin. So why do you need any other coin? <laughs> It's, we, we need more decentralization. We need more anonymity networks. We need more developers. Uh, otherwise, it's centralized. So, but no, there's nothing extremely specific about Monero other than them being a great project, spearheading privacy left and right. Uh, trustless privacy this is crucial to creating this. So aside from that, no, there's no like tie-in with the blockchain or anything like that. Um, so help me understand. I understand how onion routing works, but what is the like specific use case that Covery is meant for that would be better than Tor? Or you said it was based on I2P, right? Yes, the open specifications by I2P. Yes. So are you essentially saying why not use Tor? Um, or, I'm asking. Sorry. Yeah, basically, like, cause I'm, you're saying you want multiple networks for different use cases, right? Like, the network is stronger if you have more nodes operating in it. And Sh sure, well, okay, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Can, could someone, re could you rephrase it? Okay, Sean's, she, I can, we'll do that. Um, okay, I mean, jeez, uh, it, it's, it's all online, okay. Um, I'm thinking really technical, I'm sorry, I'm not like thinking, how do I say this? Um, okay, so Tor's, it's, first of all, they, they don't support UDP, so you have the whole transport just, just out of the equation. Um, secondly, it's a uh, leech-based network, essentially. <laughs> Everyone using it leeches off these relays that are heavily funded and, and can support a lot of bandwidth, so you have to ask, well, where does that money come from? Secondly, their whole directory authority model, in the specs, it says itself, semi-trustless, but as we know, there's no such thing as semi. It's either you trust or you don't trust. And if, you, if you're a fan of trusted setup, then, you know, then you'll understand the, the dangers involved with that. It's essentially the same thing in anonymity land. Um, with I2P, you have uh, a network database. It is truly a decentralized database that no one owns. It is uh, passed around through various routers that are randomly selected based on a uh, flood fill uh, capability, for example. But no one owns these, so there's no trust. It's up to you. You can decide a, which database you want to use, for example. You have that fine-tuned control. And it won't break the network. It won't, you don't have to go out of your way to do it. It's by default, essentially. Um, it's fault tolerant too, so if one tunnel uh, go, goes down, you have another uh, a whole set to pull from, so your message will get to where it's going, um, and it will remain anonymous on both ends, for example. Tor, you always have that exit node. I mean, assuming we're not talking about hidden services, which is very similar, uh, you always have that exit node, which the website will always see as a point, and of course, from there, it can be deduced where you are, given enough time and energy. So. Did I answer? Sorry if I didn't. Yeah, that, that helps. And Cover is just based on I2P. Based on this, yeah, the specs. Um, yes, essentially. So it is the same network. When you're using Covery, right now you are using the I2P network. You are blended in with every other router on that network. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, you, your introduction was basically saying that. Um, I mean, the way I understood it, we cannot solve, we cannot achieve real anonymity, right? Yes. And um, so your solutions basically fall into the same realm because you have to work with uh, what we have, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a hack. And, and what I'm saying is there's no piece of software on the planet that I know of or that is relatively known that is capable of achieving true privacy or anonymity. And fortunately, 
Tor does never admits to that. None of these projects admit to actually providing 100% anonymity, but no one's really talks about the underlying problem. See, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because if we don't talk about this, we're just going to hand this off to our you know, descendants, and they'll be stuck with the same crap, and they'll be going in circles and circles and circles until we have seven quintillion bit primes and you know, 500 trillion ring signatures, and et cetera, et cetera, trying to defeat this problem that cannot be defeated unless we can solve the removal of space-time while somehow existing. I know it's like far-fetched and out there and whatnot, but that's just what I wanted to say you know, as I opened. Okay, no, yeah, I just want to clarify that because it was a <clears throat> yeah, generic statement and I want to understand where you were going. So, but um, talking about coverage, so how, how, how is it, be, I mean, I understand it's trustless, uh, but at some point you can still like you said, with enough time and effort, trace back the, you know, the, the message or whatever you send it. Sure, I mean, and trust is relative. Yeah. But uh, as is with, with any of these systems, you really have to have a lot of time and energy. And right now, I mean, uh, the, the, that requires money, you know, fiat or what have you. Um, so it's all relative, but theoretically, this is what I'm talking about. Theoretically, this is possible. Realistically, I mean, I, w I would put my trust in, in this project than more than any other project, only because it's such an honest group of people who are not trying to screw each other or the world, and we're really trying to you know, apply hacks. We admit they're hacks. We're hacking our way, constantly developing, finding the best solutions at the time. And that's, I think, the best we can do at this point, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Oh, just one more question, Brian. You may have um, answered this earlier. Uh, oh, you may have answered this earlier, but why is this important for you to solve? I'm sorry, what, important to you? To solve this. To solve this problem, why is it important? Yeah. Oh, because we, don't, we wouldn't have privacy or anonymity if we don't solve it. But more importantly, I mean, personally, I believe it's because we wouldn't achieve what we've been trying to achieve since day one, which is this, this coming together, this wanting to, to come together and it actually come together. And it's, I'm, I'll go, I, I, I go, if I go too much off into that, but I'm sorry. Do you think you're getting closer to solving that problem? I think that we're, the fact that we're, I'm talking about this and we're discussing it is, a, is a closer, a step closer. Theoretically, I mean, I can't predict the future, you know, sorry. Yes? Um, so Covery, I understand, is in a different um, language. Why do we need Covery in addition to I2P? Do they have different applications? Or is Covery going to be better? Or ah, OK, so um, I have to bite my tongue a lot. when I, I, This is a tricky question, right? Because I have massive respect for the Java I2P project. Simply put, uh, we just uh, we want to do things differently in a more efficient manner. Um, with, uh, I like the approach of less is more versus more is more. Um, uh, does that answer your question? Because otherwise, I'll, I, I can go into technical details. I mean, uh, well, they have different, uh, essentially, it is the same use case. Like, you want to use the internet anonymously and privately, you just use it. But they have uh, several APIs. They have, uh, if you've seen that web console, ZZZ, I know, where's the camera? ZZZ, I mean, come on, man. Years and years and years we've been complaining about this web console, man. Please do something about it. So a web console, right, it's the only interface to this Java I2P. And it's, it's a nightmare for newcomers. So ultimately what I want to do is totally just get rid of all of, of this stuff. Like everything, all this technical stuff I want to speak about, I don't want to have to. Just like I don't want, it's an engineering thing. You don't want to talk about the, how do we build this building while we're in it. You know, this is how it's built, now we're in it. I just want simple docs, uh, simple application. You hook it in, poof, it's done. You don't think about it. If you want to know more, you read the specs, and so on and so forth. And that is the complete opposite model of the other project. Um, essentially the same technology though. So, so would a good summary of it be a reimplantation of I2P in C++, fixing a lot of the stuff that is too complicated and you don't like, but it's completely interop with the network, right? Like it's going to be plug in, and if I want to run an I2P node, I can run Kavri instead, seamless yes. to do that. Gotcha. 
although we, we may go in a different uh, technical direction uh, that would, could possibly uh, you know, essentially hard fork the network uh, because of various dramas and things that have, have come up, uh, lack of review, uh, and, you know, intentional lack of review, and just pushing out of specs and then expecting you know, us to just follow along. And I'm personally just tired of following along, but that's a whole other, we can talk more after the talk about that. But yes. Yeah, so, so from what you're saying, it kind of sounds like Kavri is application agnostic and can be implemented into any other cryptocurrencies and not just Monero, which means that it's a semi-altruistic project? He nailed it, yes. Wow, that's cool. Monero's cool. Anyway. Thank you, Diego. Yeah, isn't there like a saying, don't, don't, don't send an engineer to talk about something and something, you know, if you want a straight answer or something, you know, I don't know. That's something like that. <laughs> so, okay. Um, God, well, uh, geez, there's so much to talk about. Wow, it's, uh, we're, here, we're here till five, right? 3.51? Um, all right, so how about this? I'll just show you, and then if uh, questions come along, you know, and I can describe some of the, the details, the finer points. Um, so I'm running the router right now. I disabled the console log so you're not really seeing anything. So, uh, I'm assuming people are familiar with Tor Browser. Okay, so essentially all it does is it, it changes the, I mean, it's, uh, it does a lot of things, but one of them is with Firefox, uh, their version of Firefox, it hooks into their Sox proxy, the Tor Sox proxy. So what I did is just went ahead and clicked this and went to the, you know, edit, preferences. All right, where is this? This is IceCat, here we go, settings, and essentially make the HTTP proxy, the, you know, the Covery instance port 4446. I set it to SSL even though we don't support SSL right now, but you don't need to because everything is end-to-end -end encrypted anyway. So that's a huge thing, nothing to worry about there for the most part. I uh, set up the FTP thing because that's another little trick. Uh, sometimes your browser will do bad things, it's a, but anyway if you're not using a Sox proxy. So here we go. Click that. All right. Close that. And now we're going to check.covery.i2p. And I bet you an XMR that it's going to say 503. Am I going to lose an XMR? Damn it, I might. Come on. Ah, I'm out. OK, great. Well, well. It works, <laughs> so I'm out, but it works. it's a win for everyone. <laughs> okay, so success, welcome to the I2P network, your local client destination. So that's an, uh, something no one's asked yet. So we have IP addresses, right? You wanna to connect to Google or whatever, you have, you have an IP address, they have an IP address. You resolve with DNS. Well, there is no DNS resolution within the I2P network. Um, names uh, are canonical, they're, they're locally defined. How I define check.covery.i2p can be completely different how you do it. Uh, it's, it's extremely decentralized in that aspect. So unfortunately, uh, like many problems with all these networks, we have side channels that we use. Uh, for example, uh, address book subscription servers. Uh, but it, again, it's up to you to decide if you want to use someone's subscription. We ship a default subscription, so you know that check.covery.i2p will go to a very specific destination. And here we go, base64 encoded, SHA-256 hash of the destination. Now the identity, here it says keys, so it's Algamal public uh, uh, pub key, and then a DSA pub key, plus a certificate of metadata that essentially forms your identity. Um, and we don't have enough time to go into details. Maybe I can do that next time, or I'll just talk less about useless crap in the beginning for my next talk. But uh, so here's the base 64 encoded of that. And here's, the, here's what's something you'll see a lot. It's essentially the, B, the B32 address. You know, you go to blah, 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 that B32.i2p. And it's funny how Tor finally, finally, are coming out with their V3 onions and they're using these, these, you know, base 32 encodings. And that they have now longer addresses, something I2P has been doing for a lot longer. Um, it's, the I2P is essentially hidden services by default. I mean, that is the network, is the hidden service. That's the only way you can communicate. And here is 
the Base64 encoding of the full destination. This is something you'll see uh, when, it, when uh, creating your uh, address book, for, if you will, your subscription. Um, very technical stuff, uh, but this is how that works. So you know that you are using the network when you hook that up. So any questions on that, on this page? Yes. Sorry. By default, um, if you have an address, so, okay. Um, so, sorry. By default, what? By default, um, it's you have this address, and can people reach you through this address? So yeah. So here's yes. Here's the cool thing. All this data you're seeing here, this is identifying your identity through the SOX proxy. Um, What's really cool is you can have many, many, many identities, theoretically, but this is the one that check.covery.i2p is communicating with. And it, there's no uh, name resolution to this, um, but it, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. It, there could be if, but if the, you registered. Um, yeah, but that's more for like a, a server tunnel. This is a client tunnel. Um, and that's something I should probably talk about, client and server tunnels. Did, did someone have another question? OK. So we hooked that up to the SOX proxy. Now what Monero is going to do is bypass the SOX proxy altogether because it's clunky, it's slow, it's not effective, the error messages returned are pretty useless. Um, I mean, theoretically, they could have been using it for a while now, but they never wanted to implement a SOX proxy um, for various reasons. Uh, despite complaints. So let's go into the config file. All right. Uh, what is it? Uh, conf, yeah. Okay. So here's the uh, client, client tunnel list, essentially. Oh, there's that. I forgot to remove that. So these are de uh, default settings, right? Um, here's a good old IRC2P. Now, the I2P project started, uh, when did it start? Uh, around the same time as Tor, but it started as the, uh, as the um, invisible IRC project. I mean, it was a, essentially an IRC network. It grew into what we see now. Um, but this network is still around. It's what you use to use IRC over I2P. And we have these uh, default client tunnels. And see how the destination it has, you know, irc.echelon.i2p, et cetera. Well, you need an address book to resolve that to, for example, you know, all this goody goodie stuff here. But it's already set up, so you can, you can use it. Um, I don't have a client set up, but let's go ahead and do a quick check here. Ooh. All right. All right, well, let's just send some random data. I'm connecting through the client tunnel something that Monero will create on the fly. Possibly per transaction, you can create a new client tunnel. It'll be completely transparent, and you won't even know it. I mean, that's why I don't want to talk too much about it, because you just won't know. It'll just happen. And here we are. So we are connecting to irc.echelon.i2p via this client tunnel. And you can do the same. Look, we got SMTP set up. You can use Postman's mail service, for example. Now, let's go to the server tunnel. This is if you're going to go ahead and host a website, or for example, um, uh, Monero, a Monero node, for example. So you would, uh, well, I mean, again, this would be automated, so you don't really need, need to know all this, but uh, you just go ahead and uncheck. Here, I'll show you. Uh, these are three, yeah, I got, oh, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's funny. No, um, so let's see, long story short, there are three IRC2P servers that are chosen at random, and these are servers that have been around, and this is after a person's name. It's like his handle for, I don't know how long he's been around. Uh, not that I know of, I certainly hope not. Though I do have, <laughs> um, no, but if he's still, if he's watching this, uh, you know, his server's still broken. You know, I told him like, what, a year and a half ago that it's leaking, I, you know, public, it's leaking his public IP address, and he's like, eh, I intend to do that. So, I mean, it's, 
I, I, it's one of many reasons why I, I want to, we want, we want to move forward. Um, so I have this set up here. Oh, hello, Defcon. All right, so. Where are we? There we go. So, uh, look, here's a SSH server uh, server tunnel. So essentially, you need to tell the network, hey, here's my local destination. Here's why I, I want to be you know people to connect to, and here's the port, and here are the uh, the private public key pair right there, and it comes through this server tunnel. Um, let's see if I can do this. I have it set up, I believe. All right. So, uh, damn it, do I already have that in my history? I guess not. Okay, so where is, ah, oopsie. I'm not using TMX there. Come on. So the question is, well, okay, you created a server tunnel. What's your, how do you tell someone where your server is? Like, how do you tell them the address? Well, you go into, you know, client keys, and here we go. We have a, the base32 encoded address, and we have the base64. Essentially, you want the base32. So, let's see if we got that. And there you go. That is the address. You say, hey, friend, connect to this address. And as we saw here, oh, where'd it go? As we saw here, um, you could replace the destination with an actual base32 address or a resolvable address. But since uh, I'm currently proxy chaining through uh, Covery, I'm just going to let it do it automatically. So let's see. Proxy chaining message. What is it? Uh, da, da, da. And on at. Let's see what happens. Connection refused. Oh, that's not, what? Hey, at least it got refused. That's good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So let's try again. Well, I might I might have changed the uh, authorized keys. Oops. But essentially, it, you would be able to use the proxy chains. For example, you could proxy chains anything. Uh, to a I2P address, and it would work. Um, any questions on that so far? Okay. Am I talking enough about Monero, like how it relates to Monero? Does it, does it make sense yet, how it works with Monero? Well, because like with Monero, you know, you, you connect to a node and you send a transaction. Uh, well, your IP address is known to that node, and you have to hope that node doesn't know. So perfect use case. By default, you will never have to worry about that so long as you can connect to the internet and that you're not being censored at the packet level because um, then we would require more obfuscation with that. So I hope I answered questions. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm just curious what the kind of performances of this versus what the performances of this in terms of latency and other factors compared to Tor and the previous I2P implementations. Uh, okay, well, let's take a look. Here we are. Yeah. So, oh, let me get out of Vim here. Where we go? Sorry. There we go. So, yeah, look at that. That is this. That is a pretty small memory footprint at the bottom. That's 26 megabytes RSS. I mean, you can tell almost no. Disk, I mean, there's disk usage because we're writing the, and reading the network database, but it's right now it's trivial. This is a very small bandwidth router right now. I haven't I, just this this impl, right now this instance is is not very uh, high bandwidth, but um, the stats are all right there. I mean, this is like 1.51 percent CPU. Like if you're looking at the Java router, you know, <laughs> this is massive. It's just, it's ridiculous. I, I don't know. I you know, it is what it is, but we don't like it. So it's, it's pretty small, pretty small footprint. And what's great is we can, uh, you can eventually, once I finish my Bandcaps branch, you can tweak how much bandwidth you want to use. And of course, that will reflect on you know, the amount of crypto used, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. 
Oh, damn it. I'm sorry. Are you seeking to get this integrated with anything like um, Tails? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it's, that's up to them. It, essentially, it's agnostic. It can be used with anything that can hook into a C++ library. We'll get our marketing team on it. <laughs> OK. Oh, yes. Um, maybe I, I just don't really know a lot about it, but how does peer discovery work on uh, is it like relays, nodes, or is it basically, is it the same as ITP 2P, or did you change how ITP does it? Unfortunately, we're doing the same thing okay. as ITP, which, gotcha. again, we're, we're left with the threat model of side channel. I mean, it's absolutely absurd that to get a, a view of the network, you need to connect to a reseed server that it's, in itself has been scraping a various view of the network. So... You're relying on that view for it. So, okay, let's say you mix it up and you pick from three or four servers, whatever. You're still relying on side channels and you're still relying on a, you know, a trusted source. I, I, I'm open to ideas. I, I think you know, people have been beating their heads over this for a long time. Um, but I mean, the, literally, Tor's got, you know, I can probably count equal issues that are just unavoidable that are problems. But yeah. Any other questions? Okay, no crypto questions? All right. Well, oh, yes. Hold on, can you wait for the mic, please? Thank you. I came a little bit late, so please tell me to, you know. Oh, you missed the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah, well, just a little bit. <laughs> but um, I heard about uh, a little bit about some things that can be done to make Covery. Uh, more appropriate for more widespread usage, like to speed it up. Uh, do you have any thoughts on anything people should be focusing on to do that? For widespread adoption? Yeah, um, just to make it like more efficient, more reasonable to use. Um, user friendly to use? No, no, no. Or, or like just the technically? Actual, the actual um, performance of the network and performance of traffic on the network. Ah, uh, jeez. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that exactly. In terms of engineering or oh well, the problem with like resolving, let's say you want uh, restricted routes, for example. So you know that every hop, at least within your control, is a high bandwidth. You're just going to get it all through. Uh, you know, you got latency is not an issue. You're still stuck with Bob, who's got his tunnel pool, and you know you can't. You know, it's just going to go in like that, and I mean that's like the design of the network. Um, we could, there are other possible networks, you know, in development. Hornet, for example, it's something to look up. Yeah, I mean, if you created. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, I mean, it goes with anything. If you're creating uh, tons of key pairs and you're just generating, 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 the more, the more hops you try to connect to, the more tunnels you try to create to, I mean, it's just going to create more overhead. Uh, we use Crypto++, great library. Uh, no Loader is a great guy. Um, he's adamant about keeping things optimized and efficient. Um, I mean, the crypto is what it is. I'm not sure how to answer. I don't know if I understand the question. Now I'm thinking about like, ITP as a protocol. Well, the ITP consists of many protocols. Uh, it's a oh, yeah. common misconception. I mean, you have the transport layer. You have the message layer within the transports. I mean, you have all, all this various encryption, encryption you know, Diffie-Hellman, Elgamal, AES. Uh, it just goes on and on. Um, SHA-256. Uh, there's just a lot to do because, you know, these little garlic cloves are, you know, encrypted. The tunnels are encrypted, um, the transports, the sessions are encrypted. It's a lot of crypto. And uh, I mean, how to solve that, uh, I don't know. I mean, we're talking about non-energy. Non <laughs> somehow, somehow using non-energy for our anonymity. Maybe they'll come with our privacy mechanics model I mentioned at the beginning. Non-energy, OK. I mean, I'm not talking dark matter, but non-energy. Where'd the physicist go? She's not here. Oh, she left. All right. Um, okay, any other questions? Yes. Uh, so with the physicist, you explained that uh, each 
direction what was using a completely different uh, channel. And I was curious if that uh, provides any advantage in terms of privacy, or what's the reasoning? That's a good question, because it's still being debated. Uh, does it provide more privacy? Does it provide less privacy? There's not enough research. But the research available proves that it's fine. Um, enough. I mean, fine enough. It's, I don't know. I, I really could argue for and against both. And I could yap and yap and yap and talk and talk and talk. But, um, well, Sean is prepared to some things, too. And I'm sure he'll have, there'll be questions for him, too. Um, it's an ongoing thing. Essentially, uh, you know, we need more people, more developers, more input. You don't have to be a C++ developer. Uh, you, you don't have to be a lot of things. Just ask questions, get involved, and we'll do the best to, to see what, if there's something you can help out with. Um, yeah, Diego doesn't do anything, so he's doing great. He's doing, he's doing a lot by doing, <laughs> you're doing a lot by doing nothing. You do a lot, Diego. Okay, so yeah, any other questions? Yes? Here, let me pull up the one slide I have. So uh, I missed mo most of the beginning. I'm a PhD a particle physicist. Oh, we can talk after. Yes, but, um, yes, thank you. I, uh, Great. I was a bit bewildered by what I heard. Uh, so, um, so looking ahead, I don't know. Maybe it's premature to ask something like this. But for since since each Monero node operator gets to choose for themselves whether they are, their per their personal Monero um, client connects to the you know, legacy internet or through Covery, um, would two clients connecting in two different ways, would, would two Monero nodes talk to each other directly? Or um, could you have a situation if, say, half the Monero nodes were running Covery and half were running on the legacy internet, uh, you might have like a, like a great firewall sort of, of, of condition? That's a great question. And that's something uh, Monero Moo and Fluffy Pony and, and others would have to actually answer because I have my opinions, um, but it's, it's what they decide. So I don't, I don't know if I have an answer for you. Um, there, it, it's, 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 um, it's available. It will be available to use. And I mean, it's like my work's here, but I can only do so much. Um, I'm you know, sorry, ask them. <laughs> that made sense. Uh, did you do any, I mean, probably, but have you, but have you looked at the dev P2P, uh, like the, so I, I like Ethereum or I've been doing a lot of Ethereum stuff and Ethereum has its own kind of replacement for solving this type of problem called dev P2P. Um, dev, what, what, I'm sorry. Dev I, P2P, D-E-V P2P. Okay. It's just part of the Ethereum oh, okay. foundation's like big pool of open source is it, stuff. Is it like Dandelion? Uh, I'm not familiar with Dandelion. Okay. Uh, so. Bitcoin's non-solution. Sorry. Non Oh yeah. Um, I mean, if if you haven't looked at it, then that's fine. Uh, I was just wondering if there was any like if you had any particular like challenges to that, which is why Covery is a, a need to create another solution to. Or, but it's fine. Like I I get it. Well, I mean, at this point, it, it's everyone's got their own. Well, I can do it better. I can do it better. And you know, no one's no one's actually solving the problem. I mean, that was why I want. That, essentially, that's why I wanted to open up with my opening statement. Um, Everyone's got their approach. They think they got it, and it's just there's one you can laugh at it here, laugh at it there, not laugh at it there, and we just keep doing it until we learn how to do it right. But yeah, is this funded by the CIA? This project? Absolutely not. I'm I'm completely funded. I mean, you can you can do whatever research you want on me, FOIA, whatever, stalk me, follow me around. I don't. I mean, it'd be creepy, but if you uh, no, I'm not. Th th that's what's great about this project is entirely funded by Monero. Um, the forum funding system, for example, that's what I've been funded through. So I'm very glad to take that funding. No CIA, no, no alphabet agency, no government funding, not even the military, nothing, no research, nothing. It's all Monero. <laughs> but if they're, if they're funding you in Monero, how would you know who's sending it? Yeah, so the question is you should be stalking... Uh, yeah, given enough, well, if you were here at the beginning, enough time and energy, that would all be certain. So. Okay. No other questions. Dang, I want to talk so much more, but I tend to ramble. So here we go. Contact info if you have any questions. And I guess that concludes my portion. I would like to hand it off to Sean. He has some things prepared. 
he'll, he'll provide actual useful applications you know, for recovery. So thank you. Do you need the laptop? Thank you. It's not on here, though. It's fine. Do you, do you need the left? I'll just leave it. OK. Oh, thank you. Test. Test. All right. Hello. My name is Sean Coughlin. I go by the hacker alias Sean Coughlin. So, nice to meet you. Uh, I am a software engineer. I work in industrial systems. And I focus most of my attention on um, security features. And also, uh, I work on a number of other projects. I'm a continuing graduate student. And work on applications of encryption for the use of effective engineering and the focus on the satisfaction of client dignity in business operations. I'm here to talk about Covery's techniques and applications. Um, as an engineer, I decided to look into some of the latest IoT security protocols earlier, um, just about six months ago, and I came across I2P's implementation in Covery. Uh, then I saw it was attached to Monero, and so I decided to get involved in the Monero project. But I'm here because I really like Covery. I think it's fantastic, and this can really be the future of IoT devices. I'm going to give a brief overview about the application history of I2P and Covery. Uh, these are all based on the original work, which is called Freenet, which came out around 2000. It took some of the popular peer-to-peer -peer networks that were uh, run at like um, uh, some of the file sharing stuff that was going on in the 90s. That were, they were based on that and abstractly created a new communications layer, kind of replacing for TCP. And that started around 2000. Of course, in the 90s, DARPA was working on something similar that became the onion router, Tor. And that was alpha in about 2002. Uh, soon after that, a bunch of the workers for, or developers on Freenet decided to make a, a sort of fork of Freenet, and they called it the Invisible Internet Project. And uh, that uses their network layer from the P2P protocols. And they added an extension to onion routing that they jokingly called garlic because they were looking for some other common you know, vegetable that they could uh, call it, and so somebody came up with garlic. Uh, the differences that exist right now between onion routing and garlic is that uh, onion routes, they, in general, this is a lie, but, you know, you know humor me. Uh, for one packet, it adds the layers of encryption for each hop in the known route, meaning that every single item is there. It has to plot out the route from the source to the destination, adds the encryption to each item, and simply reduce like a Marish COVID dial until it eventually gets to the end. The nice thing about that is the entire network is bidirectional. The receiver of a packet can then simply wrap it up and go right back where it was sent from. So it's as though it's basically TCP just with a little extra stuff on top. Garlic breaks that model and says, instead of actually taking one particularly known route, we're going to take any packet of message you have, split it apart, shard it into smaller pieces, then mix in combination a bunch of things, and then get those as separate sub routes into different locations before you finally hit the destination. Uh, the problem with that is there's no way to go back to your original route. I2P is a simple unidirectional route. And so in order to get back for the original sender, you have to create a brand new channel all the way back. So it's a little bit more complicated and it adds extra, a little bit of extra uh, slowness and things like that. But it really takes all of the indirection that Tor adds and simply adds a new, new, entirely new dimension. It makes it so much harder to analyze everything. Even if you had like full network understanding, it's still really, really hard to reproduce the actual original messages. So yeah, it's just a so much better communications. It doesn't have any of the problems that that Onion has, which I'll go over in a moment. Now, there's actually two separate implementations in Java, uh, of the I2P. There's this original protocol that was called uh, I2PD that existed, and that's all I have to say about that. But there's also a, <laughs> there's also a Java implementation that's the main one that's out right now. Um, the Java I2P implementation has this, the severe problem of using Java. Uh, it makes it easy to port to new systems, but correspondingly requires a very large amount of resources. Uh, the memory requirements are about 128 megabytes by default, but they can be reduced slightly. Uh, I'll go over some specs in those. Uh, it's not really ideal for embedded systems, especially for very small microcontrollers. Um, though some Meteor Raspberry Pi boards can actually have a full function, and that's kind of the standard that we use in uh, IoT to figure out if it's possible. Uh, 
Covery is C++ entirely and therefore surpasses the Java implementation in all possible performance metrics. And it uses a boost library for compatibility. Um, I'll go on that later. Uh, this, along with other features, makes Covery a much more suited for embedded systems and for other situations where performance is important. If, for example, in the future, if you're running a, uh, a full node in, say, Monero, you're going to have resource constraints. And so if you have a choice between a Java I2P implement, if you have a choice between a Java I2P implementation and a C++ high performance uh, process, you definitely want to take the high performance one. Uh, a bit about legality, uh, especially for business cases, this is very important. In the United States, no one has been or sued for operating either a Tor relay or an I2P router. Uh, however, at the same time, importantly, illegal usage has been tracked and responded to on both networks, meaning it's not complete anarchy. There are ways of preventing people from causing damage and chaos in the network. Now, specifically, there is a problem with Tor exit relays. Uh, people have been interfered with, harassed, sued. Um, although not arrested, they've had their resources taken from them and declared contraband, even when the people were acting legally and in good faith. This has caused a lot of problems right now. And so uh, there's an actually a nice little a caveat here. Covery does not implement a an exit relay right now. So because of that, there's actually less problems with I2P implementations like, like Covery. Um, just operating a node is perfectly legal in the United States, so go ahead. You're, there's no way you're going to be harassed for that. Unfortunately, internationally, um, Tor is actually, I just found this uh, recently, Tor is explicitly illegal in Turkey. In fact, all, I, all VPNs are. Uh, I, there's no information on I2P. I just I think they haven't actually implemented that law yet. This is a brand new law due to certain problems in that country. And also, uh, China blocks all access and, uh, to both I2P and Tor. Uh, they do that by takedown notices to the websites that have IP addresses that they track it to. And it's also, they also have a quasi-legal uh, forbiddance of all forms of encryptions in certain areas. So uh, business cases for use of either of these two protocols are going to be limited because uh, one of the most important markets simply can't be involved in that at all. And so if a device was manufactured in China that would be to use some of these protocols, you're going to have some issues. So you're probably going to have to have some non-Chinese-based manufacturing process develop something that's going to be using one of these two products for an IoT device. Um, however, inter interestingly, uh, both Tor and ITP are pretty much legal everywhere else in the world. So you will have options. Um, there is little to no precedent on the industrial use of Tor or I2P. So this is basically uh, a brand new area, a wild west, where innovation is going to be dominant. And so what are the business use cases that we now can possibly have in this innovative space? Uh, for the non-embedded implementations of I2P, like what we've seen so far, there's a couple things that we can do right off the bat. Uh, composite services, which is a way of saying, let's just take what we already have and just start using that. You can use a, a combination of different protocols in any desktop or mobile de uh, devices you have right now. You can just simply start using I2P, whether the Java or the C++ implementations. Uh, it's possible right now, in fact, some companies do provide this service. EAP sites for file storage and even some um, DTD, device to device uh, services, but really the EAP site for file services is something that has precedent. And uh, EAP sites are I2P's implementation for a hidden service. You simply can go to a website and browse that as long as you know the name, the base32 or the other directory name of that site. So it is possible to provide a service where you can actually store things on the deep net. Um, this is popular in, I believe, some academic locations actually have this as a service. You can save your data and access it anywhere you want to later. Also, interestingly, this is uh, integratable right into existing apps, which um, is something that can be valuable. Let's say, let's say the Facebook Corporation wanted to uh, signify that it, it has deep commitment to the dignity of its customers and really wanted to have them have complete privacy. They said, from this point forward, our app will now communicate over the internet using Covery so that everything is encrypted. We won't know your IP address. We swear we won't violate any of your privacy. They're not going to do that, but hypothetically they could. They could simply turn it on right now and do that, which is nice because there are some customers who might have that business case where they like to signal to their customers that they really are tolerant, and so they can just use that right now. Uh, direct EAP sites, other than for like file storage. There really isn't much demand for that right now because in most locations, especially in the United States, uh, this white market transactions and everything that needs to be kept above board, most businesses are required to keep some form of user-relevant information, 
uh, either for KYC, some of the exchanges, or um, just simply being able to collect uh, receipts and other things. So let's say, let's say you used some EAP site like Amazon or something like that. They'd still have to get your address. So a lot of the privacy information, it doesn't really make much diff sense for them if they're going to collect some important information from you to do that. However, if there were services available on EAP sites, it would signal very, you know, very, be very well regarded by the privacy community and would really signal the, the service's commitment to customer focus. If they wanted to allow the customer to say, we want, really want to make sure that you are comfortable using our, ser our services, we inherently are showing we don't want to know where your contact information is. Here you go, you can use the service. And that's also available immediately. Uh, interestingly, because this is so new, there's some brand new features that nobody's really thought of before, like um, device to device, direct communications. Uh, it's even possible in the theory to have every particular device you have run as a separate, uh, separate router. So you can have things like mesh networks and you can even do webs of trust where you have known, uh, um, known destinations sign a particular uh, base32 address to say, okay, I trust this particular service so you can actually communicate correctly across these, um, these locations. Uh, there's no offline mode. Um, ITP simply doesn't support that. But I think probably overall the, the best thing was kind of similar to what I was just saying, the support for ITP networks. Any customer right now has the ability to say, we support Tor and we support ITP. Now, Covery doesn't have these exit nodes that Tor does. But in the context of, of Tor, there's simply a way that, or, or if we do, if Covery does have access to exit nodes in the future, it would be very similar to the way Cor, uh, Tor has those. Uh, websites currently have the ability to monitor for the use of Tor in ITP. And many of them specifically decided to deny or restrict access to the full features for the users that are registered from those IP addresses, those exit, exit boxes. Some major websites are even threatening to do this well after they had previously fully supported an anonymous usage. A Covery has no way to prevent this. But the easiest form of support for the Covery project is for websites to announce a policy that they will not prejudice users who choose to connect through Covery. While simple, this will signal their website owners trust in use of an anonymizing technology and their commitment for fair access to all. And this is true especially for websites acting as an infrastructure a free and open source software or internet communications. Uh, this can be a, an important declaration of support for users' rights. I bring this up specifically because there was a major website where you would get things on a major hub, and it was purchased by this large software corporation recently. And so there's been some threats to remove access for people using Tor exit nodes, which is weird because that's probably the best case for people to communicate privately. Um, that's a big threat. And after that actually happened, I decided to remove my support of that website because I simply didn't want to deal with people changing their minds when they previously made a lot of stink about saying we're, we support everyone. So I think there is going to be a business case for that, that if you threaten to remove users, a lot of people are going to revolt. Um, on the embedded side, instead of just simply supporting what we currently have, the embedded side is really interesting. This is fascinating to me. Uh, hypothetically, you can add new things for the device to device, but that's kind of similar to the way that the current thing goes. But for me, my focus is on IoT. And so I'd like to compare the services that we have with these. The IoT, the Internet of Things. And, well, from a security perspective, it's also known as iOS, which is the Internet of Things. Uh, yes, there's a lot of security problems. IoT was really fantastic in its, great, in its original thought. It was a great way of connecting devices in an arbitrary, maybe even hostile environment to connect from a known device produced by a particular designer. Have it connect to the services provided by the designer. So you're actually purchasing a service, not a device. Most people who are very familiar with technology don't really like that much because it removes us as a factor. However, we're not most people here. Most people, they just want to have a service. They'd like to pay money and have something dedicated and work for them. And business cases can be well designed to satisfy that. But the people involved in designing these systems have to understand the threat that they provide by taking power away from their users. When you remove that power, you remove the dignity of them to actually be, to be satisfied. It requires you as a designer to put a lot of faith in yourself and to understand the future and the threats that your, your very model that you're providing for people will be satisfied. You're taking their privacy in your hands. 
it's your responsibility as a designer to make sure you actually have that power. You, know, you don't abuse it and you actually are responsible for that power. So I'd like to go over a couple of these IoT protocols that are very popular nowadays and discuss some of the limitations of them and also introduce why embedded covery is going to be, I think, the, the best possible solution right now. So the first and most common protocol is known as HTTP, or also RTSP, and well, just plain old-fashioned FTP. No, not HTTPS, not FTPS, and the most popular one is just HTTP. Most devices just send clear text communication right over the Internet. I'm responsible for, for maintaining some of those, and uh, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, UPnP was actually, um, a thought was actually putting encryption into that and allowing uh, dynamic port openings and just dynamic communications over the Internet. They created uh, a couple protocols called Device Protection and Device Security Service. Unfortunately, those have been shown to have severe security flaws right from the design. So for briefly, that was thought to be a replacement for some of the other protocols, but it's been pretty much completely abandoned. It's useful just for opening ports, but not a whole lot else. The most popular right now, maybe even surpasses HTTP on new devices. TLS, the Transport Layer Security, which is a new version of SSL. Uh, this was designed with websites in mind. It works fantastic for human interaction systems when there's some human that makes a decision. Uh, most users have been well trained to look for that little logo in the upper left-hand corner of their browser to let them know that the, the website they're going to is trustworthy, that there's some certificate authority that has said this website is who they say they are. Uh, a lot of phishing has been trying to get people to click on links they don't trust, so it's a lot of IT work to make sure people are trained. Don't do that. That's great for websites where you have a human decision being made because ultimately if some user just doesn't understand and makes a mistake, they are the ones who pay. It's their responsibility. It's their decision. It's their initiative. When you're dealing with IoT devices, the customer does not have that decision. You're making that decision for them. And so you, if you're going to be making something, you've got to make sure you put everything you know, you design your protocol around something that doesn't, that doesn't allow user um, override. TLS is designed around certificate authorities. Uh, it's great because it allows designers to have their own internal certificate authority, and usually they send out X509 certificates, which are generally okay. Not the best, but they work. And there's even new extensions of TLS to make them more IoT compatible, like TLS 1.3. It removes some of the work required and uh, reduces some of the known attack vectors. And there's even things like uh, certificate pinning that makes it very easy for IoT developers to just simply go in and say, okay, just here's this certificate, trust it for your lifetime. Uh, there are a lot of problems with design, though. Uh, certificate pinning is vulnerable on the first use. In other words, if a device gets reset or flashed the first time somebody puts in a cert on, they have complete control over everything. And that's one of the uh, major ways of, if you go over the IT, IoT village, you see that pretty much the first thing anybody does on a device. Um, and even worse, if a certificate authority is actually compromised, every device is compromised too. It's the one control. Get password access to that, it's over. Hackers have everything. And even, unfortunately, TLS assumes TCP communications, so you have to have full bidirectional access. There's no, da no datagrams, no async, nothing. You've got to be connected online every time you use that. And most people don't have Wi-Fi connected all the time, so... They're going to have to walk around with devices that are disconnected for a very long period of time, which, of course, means everything's running old firmware with known vulnerabilities and everything. So, meh. That just causes more nightmares. Um, the, uh, the new TLS or reduces a, a layer, but it still has, like, three-round duplex real-time communication. So you have to have something that's fast, dedicated, low latency on your connection. So it's really hard to use, like, low-speed low communication layers, which is just more of a mess, especially if you're downloading like new firmware, which might be pretty big. You gotta have a fast one. Um, the problems with internal certificate authorities, they're actually pretty, pretty complicated. Uh, what's happening nowadays is that most uh, IoT developers are actually buying outside vendors. They sell modules as a service. Um, they're third-party services, but they have the, they, this is interesting, they, they generally do have the predictability and flexibility that corporate clients prefer over costly dedicated development programmer teams. And the nice thing about a, a module vendor is you can, if they violate your security, you can sue them and blame them. Hey, it wasn't us. Look at these guys. Look at those guys over there. Um, and that's been a lot. Most of the IoT uh, um, leaks and everything are actually people just saying, well, it wasn't our fault. It was our vendor, so you've got to blame them, which is nice from a legal perspective, but not really from a customer perspective. 
And even then, um, the entire use of the third party decreases the trust model. As there are ever more third parties and the third parties buying more third parties, everybody has access to your data along that chain. Even if they promise they don't, there's always some override where they can't, they can't get everything. Um, oh, if the uh, certificate authority expires, which some of these actually do, I've seen them, they have expirations in them, then you've got brick devices. If the uh, certificate authority is compromised or must be reset, then you have brick devices. And oh, <laughs> um, some of the protocols for IoT are actually plain text by default, like MQTT, the most popular protocol. That's all plain text. There is no security built into that, so meh. Uh, a couple of examples that are going on right now, you, you probably have heard about these already. Uh, Amazon Web Services. They have an IoT branch that supports TLS in their own version of MQTT. They're the only one that, they're the first um, group that allows MQTT to have an encrypted communication right off the bat. And they even have these things called IAM roles where you can go in and say, I want this device to have this communication capacity. This is great and it's convenient, but it really requires you to be embedded with uh, Amazon the entire way from the device manufacturer all the way through use. So if they ever change anything, yeah. you're always trusting Amazon's service. Uh, they have this just-in-time registration where you can say, I want to take my old IoT device and start using it now. But you're still going through AWS. Oh, and there's a brand, well, not brand new, but it's a relatively newcomer called Datagram TLS, which doesn't use TCP. It's lightweight and it's fast and everything, but it has a lot of known vulnerabilities. So if anybody has a DTLS device, go bring it over to the IoT Hacking Village and uh, watch and cry. <laughs> Um, there's also this other one that I was following a while back called HPKP. It's known as HTTP Public Key Pinning, meaning that you can really guarantee that the device, once, once the firmware device is burned in, it's guaranteed to connect to only the server. Um, the problem is it's dead. Netflix killed, or no, no um, Firefox killed it. So that's done. It doesn't exist anymore. A lot of people were developing on that and they just had to switch immediately. There is this other protocol called SASL, the Simple Authentication and Security Layer which is a really nice way of um, abstracting your LDAP or your, um, your security protocols. It's the basis of LDAP. So if you ever use LDAP, you use SASL right out of the box. It's really flexible, which is nice. Unfortunately, it has extremely heavy restrictions on the communications allowed. So it's not useful for IoT. Um, there is an implementation called XMPP, which has been the kind of like the, uh, the it girl of two, uh, 2018. Um, it has a couple of protocols called provisioning and discovery, which are very similar to the way I2P works. Um, it also uses globally unique, IP, or globally, globally unique addresses like um, the base32 address in I2P. It's modular, which is um, very nice for small devices. It actually runs in uh, Cortex M0s. It has a very small memory footprint. And it's, uh, it's also just kind of considered the coolest thing out right now, except it still support, it still requires TLS and SASL. And, uh, <laughs> this is the weirdest thing. It actually was designed for text messages, so there's no such thing as binary data. You have to, re you have to encrypt or encode everything in um, base 64 in MIME format to do anything. So if you have anything, any binary data like your firmware, you're going to add, what, 23, 25 or 33% off the bat right, by default, so you're just adding more and more data on there. There really is no compression to think of. So great in theory, but eh, just not doing everything right. And also there's there's some brand new communicate. We actually just heard about that before, like things like CJDNS, Tink, Crust. There's numerous other um, layers that are being added on. Uh, they're beginning work on creating a new super network above TCP as a way of uh, encrypting communications. Uh, many of these use classical patterns such as pseudonymous identification, which are known, have to su known to have severe flaws that onion and garlic routing was specifically designed to address. Um, but on the security versus speed scale, these tend to have pretty good implementations on the speed side. Uh, for, for IoT devices that really want high speed, say a smart television that wants to connect over uh, unknown networks, or just networks, you, this is actually a pretty good path to take because you want speed more than anything. Uh, but for, say, industrial control systems that have all the security problems, they're willing to sacrifice speed in order to gain more security. Um, in general, the IoT devices that have security problems have latency built in, so they don't really need speed. Uh, but the, uh, the newer systems, CJDNS, really, um, it it's actually has a significant increase in performance over TLS, so that's something to look into if you're interested in that. Uh, also, 
most of these projects are so new, they don't actually have any performance metrics. So I can't compare how fast they are compared to Kovri. So your guess is as good as mine. Also, there's a brand new one called TLS SRP, which is a way of making TLS much more IoT compatible, but it's still a work in progress right now. So there's no metrics, no anything. Um, there's a lot of talk. The people who are really big into XMPP this year are now talking about TLS SRP because it's just kind of really cool. It's, I think, the best competitor to Covery in the embedded IoT sphere uh, over the next couple of years. All right. Now, those are all the protocols that nobody is probably ever going to use ever again or hear about either after this. So let's go talk about Tor, the onion router. Um, Performance-wise, well, you, you know about the, the onion protocol, how it wraps everything up like a Marsh COVID doll, and how that differs from Covery and I2P. Performance metrics. Tor, by default, runs on Linux at about 512 megs minimum, which is a pretty huge impact. It's pretty significant. Now, there are implementations that can be brought down to very small, through, uh, very small amounts. Like there is, um, for T, uh, TP link routers in OpenWRFT, you actually only need about 64 megs of RAM for running a full uh, Tor router, which is impressive. But still, that's a lot more than, say, uh, smaller devices like a, a Core M series, Core M series can, uh, can run. Tor has this new system that was created just recently called the Authenticated Hidden Service or onion authorization. Uh, there was a demo that was released about two years ago when the original thought was that they could actually implement this. It was about home security. So you can have all of your, um, all of your cameras, all of your baby monitoring systems hooked up through Tor automatically so that you couldn't have some of the problems like uh, weirdos on the internet breaking into your baby monitoring systems, things like that. So uh, it actually works fairly, fairly well. You're able to um, get a cookie password and uh, log in and be able to access these devices right through Tor as though you were communicating over the, over the open net internet. Uh, there's no way to probe for services from the outside unless you have a cookie. And uh, the API is called uh, Hidden Service Authentication Client. Uh, current implementations are based on what's called the basic mode, which is very limited. There's only 16 devices internally. There's another, another pro uh, protocol called Stealth Mode, which is very difficult to work with and impossible to scale. Also, cookies have 128-bit security or bit encryption, which is nice, but a little bit less than you expect nowadays. Uh, generally, uh, authenticated hidden services are a good idea, but they don't really have what IoT needs, especially in the memory aspect, which finally brings us down to embedded covery uh, in something I'm really excited for. On an open WRT router, um, this has about 21.4 megabyte memory profile, which is just good enough for some very small devices. Maybe not the Cortex-M series, but definitely the A series and anything really small, uh, anything slightly, small, uh, slightly bigger than the M series. Uh, again, I'm probably lying right now, but I think this is kind of interesting. Um, Covery ITP has a lot of flexibility in that, let's say you want a certificate authority with an X509 certificate. You can throw that in as your, as your destination encryption. Want a completely separate protocol? Go ahead, throw that in too. Add 255.19. Use that. Use whatever you want. Anything works. It's scalable. And this is interesting. Uh, let's say you have your, um, your EAP site, your destination server, hooked up with um, one port that's receiving multiple destinations. You do a receive on a port. You can tell how many, or not only have multiple destinations dedicated to a particular port on your box, you can also have, let's say, once you do a receive, you can tell which destination it came from. So you can tell exactly which client was requesting which destination at a given time. And since you can create any arbitrary number of destinations at a time, you can just scale up to whatever you want to. Uh, how many ports are allowed in a computer? 65K. Um, how many destinations are allowed for a port? I don't know, 65K. So you can have, what, 4 billion destinations on one simple box. So you can support 4 billion separate devices connecting to you or 4 billion separate services. That's pretty good scale as far as I'm concerned. Uh, nothing else even comes close to that. Oh, uh, interesting this too. Basically, you can have your uh, uh, completely automated anti-DOS attack. Let's say you have X devices and you, a thousand devices, and you have a hundred destinations that you make up, just separate numbers that to connect to for the same thing. So you have 10 devices per destination. You get a DOS attack in one of those destinations because somebody just doesn't like you and decides to do some distributed DOS and spam you with a bunch of stuff. So you can decide to just take down that one destination off your router, gone. All those go to dev null. All, all that spam just disappears entirely. 
all your other customers work and those 10 customers that were hard bound to that one particular destination, well, they'll, they'll be offline temporarily. You can bring them back whenever. So that's an automatic anti-DOS without having to shift servers or anything. Just turn off the destination in your router, you're done. Other ideas you can go with. Let's say every version has a separate destination. Well, in the old destinations, you just, you know, instead, of, instead of responding with anything, you just say, here's your upgrade, just upgrade your firmware, done. So no matter how old it is, it just automatically gets upgraded every time, and they get a new destination every time. Or you could even bring it as far as like one destination per customer device, so you know exactly where, which device itself is coming. You don't need a serial number. You just see the, the request coming in, and you're good. Um, all destinations can be, well, they can be hidden for the use cases. You, somebody can tell whether they exist by the route actually getting through, but you can't tell what they're used for. This is really cool because this allows for a lot of new ideas that nobody's had before. Like, Covery's not just the best IoT communications protocol I've ever seen, but it's actually, it actually enti allows entirely new methods of communication. It's possible now to prove your device's security. You can actually prove your device is secure. You no longer have to say, trust me. Um, in the case of, say, our, like a hardware manufacturer, we already have a lot of the, um, situations where you have secure elements built in. Let's say your secure element generates a destination keys. So therefore, only a secure element has a private key. Then you can publish a base64 public key version of that and have that as your destination point. Release your secure element source code as open source, have that publish its own hash. You have a way of now proving no one can possibly get access to your, your IoT device's private key even the people who designed it. Uh, this allows for really cool things because it's very similar to the way hardware wallets work. How about a hardware wallet that actually sends out its own transactions? Just sends them out. You don't need to connect to a device. Just go. Sends it out to whatever it can connect to. Eventually it connects to a router and sends. In Monero, in pretty much all blockchains, all transactions are idempotent. I mean, you can just keep sending the same transaction over and over and over and get there eventually. Just wait for your customer to let you know whether or not it happened or you can have something else monitoring the blockchain to see whether or not that particular transaction went through. But you, don't need a, you actually don't need any way of connecting your hardware device. It actually keeps it open. And of course, it will have to, you have to get through places to update it with the current blockchain so that you know it's actually done. But maybe Cobra can get through that too. But yeah, that's a great way of actually sending device to device hardware identified um, transactions. Or just anonymous device to device communications, like a, a human communication net mesh, where you can have people send messages or transactions to each other without connecting to the internet at all. Simply have each device acting as a router where everybody, if you get in communications with each other or even just have it automatic over the air updates. As you walk between different locations, you can have everything communicate. You'll never know where the information came from, only that it got to wherever it needed to get to. Um, also, D2ALG, meaning you can have like a cloud-based system using that very same thing. Have a device that's disconnected and simply sends data up to the cloud. How about a Fitbit, Fitbit device? I can't update my Fitbit unless I have a device that's communicating to the internet. Why not just have it asynchronously update everything through a Covery router and have that eventually get updated? Then it can get sent there. So you don't need to have a constant web access for your IoT devices. It simply gets updated automatically whenever it needs to. Uh, there's a lot more innovative ideas that can happen now because this, this is just fun. It's, there's all the rules that eventually were in place are now broken. You can, do, you can do so much more that there's really a lot of things that can happen that I don't know about. This is, this is really a joy because... IoT has usually been a problem recently. It's been getting bad press. There's a lot of things you can't do to maintain security. This breaks a lot of those rules. You can now go and do things that you always wanted to do without any security models. So yeah, um, this is a pleasure. Oh, and um, I'd like to go over building the Covery, uh, building Covery is embedded. We do have an Android build, um, but as far as getting it to actually work as an embedded system, uh, that's to be determined. I, I have a little bit of problems with that, but. That should be out very soon. So yes, I really think Covery is the best IoT protocol ever invented. And it gets back to where it always was supposed to be. All right. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, did, did we have any questions for Sean here at the end about anything that he's talked about? No. Oh, oh, we got one in the back. Okay, okay, hold on. I'm going to be on my way there. Oh, you know how much walking you can do in Vegas? Okay, my legs hurt. Let's go. Uh, hi, thanks for your talk, Sean. Um, 
I was wondering if you had had any uh, experience or any luck getting it to run on any uh, other embedded ARM devices, uh, even though the, the Android build uh, is still has some kinks to work out. Um, the numbers that I had on there was it was actually about I think it was like 30 30 megs in total So that wasn't that bad, but I didn't do a full test on actually committing getting a lot of Connections to the internet. I just ran some simple tests like unit tests But once that's available, I'd be able to publish all the information on that plus there's probably some other um, uh, Embedded uh, links I could just remove uh, It's probably extra resources, so it's going to be smaller than that once I get that running uh, if it gets down to like maybe uh, 12 megs or less that's available on even like the smallest Cortex M devices, so that'd be really nice. There, there. If there is some research into minimal implementation, that'd be really worth the effort because that will make pretty much any device, any IT device available, plug and play right into this. Um, to shrink the mi minor. You said? Oh, shrinking the binary. Oh, yeah, shrinking the binary is nice, but also just the general use of memory. The uh, less memory use is possible, the better. Um, there's certain things you could do to, say, optimize the memory access, keep, uh, keep everything to a really low profile. Some of the IoT devices have very small memory, like four megs still. You still have to, um, uh, SOCs, or at least it's just four megs in them. Those are specialty items. You usually can have a lot more than that. But the less, you know, less is more, so, as an animal said, so. Thanks. Um, what do you think are going to be the major roadblocks in people adopting Covery for these sorts of applications that you're talking about on a large scale? Uh, the, road, the major roadblock against uh, implementation right now is the lack of any history. There's, nobody's done this before. And especially when it comes to legality, some people just automatically assume anything to deal with uh, Tor or I2P is automatically just for those hacker guys. And they do, yeah, the scary implementation or, or the scary uh, suggestions. Uh, if there is a f successful implementation that works in, in a really tough situation, something that gains attention, that could be very valuable. And so um, one of the things I want to do is actually implement this in a, in a new direction, in a new project that could bring about a lot of attention and let people know. So some of the major questions so far are always about, well, if Monero is the only um, system that actually uses Covery, then won't everybody be able to tell that everything that's going on in Covery is Monero only? Won't they tell that you're a person who's involved in mining or sending transactions because you use Covery? So if there is some other application out there that uses something else, you at least begin to have what's called the plausible deniability issue, where you can say, well, I could be doing this other thing. I could be bird watching and sending pictures of cats on the internet back and forth or something like that. So un until we have a good you know, uh, environment where we have multiple use cases, uh, that attitude is still going to be there. Uh, this is basically the same thing that the internet was back in the mid-90s. Everybody thought it was for those weirdo hackers. They're, they're the ones who send text messages back and forth. Real people always use fax machines or something. You know? So uh, once that attitude is broken, um, just simply due to precedent, then this will be more stable. And IoT devices tend to be more conservative, um, which is why the security model threats have been really you know, racking everybody together. Generally, the same the HTTP model has been around for basically 20 years. That's finally broken now that you're using at least TLS. But simple, clear text transactions have existed for, yeah, for a very long time. And it's only this constant push to say, hey, you've got to be responsible for your actions that have lifted people in the IoT world out from using that to put any encryption there. So there has to be precedent, and really there has to be push too. This is, a, this, as far as I'm concerned, is a business model. You can signal to people the fact that you are providing trusted computing. You are signaling to everyone that, hey, I don't know who you are, and, I'm, and we're gonna, we have a contract. We're going to make sure that I don't have the information, and that's part of the business process I provide for you. It might cost you more money as a service um, to, to get what I'm offering, but I can guarantee you that you are not the product. You are the customer. I'm not going to resell your information out to third parties and target advertising to you. All right, thank you, Anonymous and Sean, for your guys' presentation on Covery. It's something that the whole Monero community is talking about and excited about. Alpha release just came out, and hopefully we'll be integrated into the Monero testnet before the end of the year. Just the testnet.
Just the test net. Thank you so much. You can take this badge also. 